Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale, the headlines. Russian military blogger killed in explosion at a cafe in St. Petersburg in what appears to be a second assassination on Russian soil. Ukraine describes Russia assuming the UN Council presidency on the 1st of April as the world's worst April Fool's joke. Plus, North Korea accuses Ukraine of having nuclear ambitions. A well-known Russian military blogger, Vladimir Tataski, has been killed in a blast in a cafe in St. Petersburg in what appears to be the second assassination on Russian soil since it invaded Ukraine last year. According to Russian news agencies, the blast was caused by an explosive device. Mr. Tataski, whose real name was Maxim Fomin, had more than 560,000 followers in Telegram and was one of the most prominent of the influential military bloggers who have provided an often critical running commentary on Russia's military operation in Ukraine. He was among hundreds of attendees at a lavish Kremlin ceremony last September to proclaim Russia's annexation of four partly occupied regions of Ukraine, a move that most countries at the UN condemned as illegal. A St. Petersburg website said the explosion took place at a cafe that had once belonged to Yevgeny Prigozhin, founder of the Wagner private army that is fighting for Russia in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Russia's state investigative committee said it had opened a murder investigation into the blast that left at least 25 people wounded and 19 treated in hospital, adding that everyone who was in the cafe at the time of the explosion are being questioned by authorities. The chief press officer of the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs in St. Petersburg, Vacheslav Stepchenko, said the police received information that there had been an explosion in a cafe uh, confirming that military blogger Vladimir Tatansky was amongst the dead. However, a leading Russian official pointed the finger at Ukraine without providing evidence. And six civilians have also been killed and eight wounded in Russian shelling of Konstantinivka in eastern Ukraine. The town, which is home to about 70,000 people, at least it was before the war, is just 20 kilometers west of Bakhmut, the epicenter of fighting for at least eight months as Russian forces have tried to capture the city. Andrei Yemek, head of the Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky's chief of staff's office, said 16 apartment buildings, eight private buildings, a kindergarten and an administrative building had been damaged. And the Bucharest nine foreign ministers said, quote, nothing good can be expected from Russia's rotating presidency of the United Nations Security Council in April. The summit of the group of nine, a, a list of countries on the eastern edge of NATO, was jointly hosted by the foreign ministers of Romania and Poland in the Polish city of Lutz and was aimed at coordinating their security positions ahead of a full NATO summit in July. Nothing good can be expected from this uh, presidency, and I hope that Russia will exercise restraint in exercising this uh, presidency without affecting the efforts at the level of the United Nations and, in general, the level, um, the, uh, the level of, uh, of uh, the international community as a whole uh, to, um, um, well, to uh, move forward with uh, the resolution of uh, the conflict in uh, Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says it was absurd that Russia had assumed the rotating presidency of the United Nations Security Council, adding that this showed the institute, uh, institution's, quote, total bankruptcy. Over the weekend, Russia took over the presidency of the UN's top security body, which rotates every month. The last time Moscow held the post was in February of 2022, when it launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Unfortunately, we also have news that is obviously absurd and destructive. Today, a terrorist state began to chair the UN Security Council. Yesterday, the Russian army killed another Ukrainian child, a five-month-old boy. His name was Danilo. He was from Advokum in Donbass. 
together with his parents. Parents are wounded. Russian artillery, one of the hundreds of artillery attacks that the terrorist state carries out every day. And at the same time, Russia is chairing the UN Security Council. It is hard to imagine anything that proves more the total bankruptcy of such institutions. There is no form of terror that Russia is not already committed, and there will be no reason that will stop the reform of global institutions, in particular the UN Security Council. The reform that is obviously overdue. To prevent a terrorist state and any other state that wants to be a terrorist from destroying the peace, terrorists must lose, must be held accountable for terror and not preside anywhere. Vladimir Zelensky. Meanwhile, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba has described Russia as viewing the UN Council presidency as its brutal evasion of Ukraine stretches into a second year as the world's worst April Fool's joke. The presidency of the Security Council rotates alphabetically among its 15 member nations. The body is controlled by its first uh, five permanent members, including the US and Russia. A Security Council president is supposed to stay neutral, but in its new role, Russia can maneuver meetings on Ukraine and use the month to portray the US and other Western countries as making false accusations against Russia. In the meantime, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says that Russia's decision to station nuclear arms on the territory of Belarus signals a failed meeting with China. The Ukrainian president was speaking during a news conference alongside leaders of Slovenia, Slovakia, Moldova and Croatia. If you want to know my personal opinion, Information that Russia will station nuclear weapons at the Belarus territory indicates failing meeting with China. Russia wanted to demonstrate that it still plays a Russia wanted to demonstrate that it still plays a certain role, something Russia lost under the rule of President Putin. Secondly, it signals that the Russian president wants to show some political steps or victories, but he could not achieve them at the battlefield. And it is absolutely clear how the bloody war they started will end. We don't want to live in a world which is run by trucks. Uh, we are here today to remind the world about the atrocities committed by the Russian troops and we are here to make commitments and we made a strong commitment because we support the Bucha declaration, we support the creation of the international uh, tribune. Uh, we are here to make the commitment that all these atrocities, the crimes against humanity, the crimes against the Ukrainian people will be investigated and punished. All the crimes committed should not be left unpunished. And that's why the security of Europe can be increased only if we respect international law and not let unpunished those who violate it. This is the whole point of what we are all doing and here Ukraine is sticking to the values that we all share. We can assist as much as possible and uh, we continue to do that in the future as well. Uh, which is why I'm here, to show also the solidarity not just of the government but also of the people. North Korea's Kim Yo-jong, the powerful sister of its leader Kim Jong-un, has accused Ukraine of calling for nuclear weapons, basing her assertion on an online petition that has drawn under a thousand signatures so far. Ms. Kim said this kind of petition could be a political ploy by President Vladimir Zelensky's office, but did not provide any evidence for the assertion. Following Russian President Vladimir Putin's announcement last week that Moscow plans to station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, a public petition was filed to the Ukrainian presidential office website on Thursday, March the 30th, calling for Ukraine to host nuclear weapons on Ukrainian territory or for it to be armed with its own nuclear weapons. However, Kiev officials have not commented on the petition uh, so far. And former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson has announced that he's running for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination, launching a challenge to former President Donald Trump, who remains the front runner despite his looming criminal indictment. 
Mr. Hutchinson, governor of the Southern State from 2015 until early this year, after serving in the U.S. House of Representatives, said he would make his a formal announcement in Arkansas later this month, but has decided to run. I have made a decision, and my decision is I'm going to run for president of the United States. First of all, the office is more important than any individual person. And so uh, for the sake of the office of the presidency, I do think that's too much of a sideshow and distraction, and he needs to be able to concentrate uh, on uh, his due process, and there is a presumption of innocence. Let's go and talk uh, to Stephen Hayes, President Emeritus, Corporate Council in Africa, former President, American Center on International Leadership, as was President Cohen and Woods International joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. Good morning to you, Stephen. As always, thank you for your time. Hey, good morning, Lali. Good to see you again. Uh, let's uh, let, let's start off uh, with uh, Mr. Hutchinson, shall we? Uh, he's the latest to throw his heart into the ring in what is fast becoming uh, a fairly complicated uh, race. And I say that because the front runner, at least on the Republican side, is uh, Donald Trump. And everyone is expecting uh, that he will uh, be criminally indicted the first time a U.S. president will be in that position uh, in the country's history, possibly as early as tomorrow. Uh, but he remains the front runner, and everyone else who would have taken advantage of the position has jumped to his defense because he still controls the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that, especially ahead of this uh, indictment tomorrow? Well, I, I think that uh, the Republican Party hasn't shown a great deal of courage, frankly, to uh, fall behind, uh, stand behind, I guess, Donald Trump at, at this early stage. And I think that, uh, as you know, I've, I've have said all along, I still think it's too early. I think there's a lot of things that can happen. But yes, right now, uh, Donald Trump is, is the uh, front runner. As far as Mr. Hutchinson entering the race, I, I am relieved in a sense that his his primary statement was that you need leadership that appeals to to the best of man rather than their worst instincts, which I think was still it was very strong uh, statement uh, towards uh, Donald Trump, although he won't say it quite that 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 was intended. But uh, I think everyone understands that. So I, I think that have someone who has the courage to enter against possibly long odds is is encouraging, and I hope that it, it uh, plays a moderating role on the. Uh, on the race, uh, we'll we'll see. But uh, Congressman and uh, former Governor Hutchinson uh, actually is seen as a fairly moderate uh, person. He's, his record in Arkansas and uh, in Congress was reasonable within the spectrum of the Republican Party, and I, th I think he is a uh, a very decent uh, person. And I'm I'm glad to see him in the race now. The, uh, the, this is important, of course, uh, because uh, whoever is in the race uh, and whoever has the potential of contesting against what is likely to be President Joe Biden, I'm coming to ask you about that incidentally, uh, will then be in control of U.S. policy as far as it uh, concerns Russia and Ukraine and this conflict. So I, I, I want to mm -hmm. ask you, um, first of all, Everybody seems to think it's a done deal. All the fillers are out there, but there's been no formal announcement that uh, President Biden at 81, uh, probably uh, going to be the oldest man ever to contest the U.S. presidency, is going to contest. Well, it looks like very much like he's going to. I know many of his advisors and his fundraisers, and they're certainly uh, expecting that announcement soon. Uh, I think it's amazing. Uh, but again, uh, in terms of um, party leadership, party following, it's not simply Republicans. The Democrats are falling in line as well. I see no challenger to uh, Joe Biden at this stage either. And I, I doubt that, that, that there will be, certainly when he announces he's going to run again, which seems almost a certainty, uh, then um, there won't be a challenger, uh, at least uh, not a serious one. So I think that it's going to be uh, an interesting race. Certainly age is a, is a factor. Um, 
but uh, it's also a, a reality. Uh, we're quite, we're, it's, it looks like we're going to have the oldest uh, possible, well, we already have, we will be the oldest president and certainly the oldest uh, candidate as well. Let me bring you to the the Russia America relations, especially as it uh, has panned out with with this conflict in two. Uh, we all saw the drama that went with Brittany Griner's arrest and re subsequent release after she was found guilty of uh, uh, possession of drugs, uh, and then of course we saw that uh, uh, Paul Whelan uh, was brought home subsequently. Uh, but again, the the question or the conundrum appears to be that in spite of the situation and in spite of what America uh, knows and tells its citizens, uh, they keep going to Russia and, you know, given the opportunity for the Russians to effect this arrest and use them, if you like, as pawns or as leverage uh, in this uh, battle. Well, I, I think that's, uh, we've gone back to the uh, Cold War mentality again. It's interesting that this was one of the uh, the so-called uh, 12 points that China's so-called peace plan was, that, that uh, we end the Cold War mentality. But in fact, we've clearly gone back to it. And I think that's, that's going to continue until there's a, there's a, a more moderate uh, dialogue i should say uh, i'd say more moderate leadership but, but uh <clears throat> let's take leadership as it is there certainly needs to be a dialogue so i, I think i think there does need to be a continuing dialogue i'm encouraged that uh, blinken and the foreign minister of russia lavrov had a uh, discussion via phone even though it obviously it wasn't uh, i don't know obviously but apparently it was it was not not a friendly one and you couldn't couldn't expect one at, the, at this stage but there does need to be uh, continuing links. Uh, you cannot solve a problem without dialogue. Uh, whether citizens go or choose to travel and go back and forth, uh, it's still the individual citizens. But I think that the dialogue needs to, you need to keep every channel open possible, even if you don't like the person you're, you're talking to. And I think dialogue is essential. Speaking about dialogue, uh, that the visual we're watching on the screen uh, just a moment ago uh, was the Russian president and the Chinese leader uh, who went to Moscow. Uh, and uh, so much was made of that visit and the potential that it had uh, to create a really uh, significant, uh, shall we say, alliance of some sort between two of the world's nuclear powers and certainly uh, two people who do not share America's uh, ideas uh, about the world order. Uh, but since then, since that meeting took place, uh, um, there has been shifts, if you like. Uh, China has not come out, obviously, to support Russia with physical weapons or to say anything that would be misconstrued. You referenced the plan that they talked about, which Russia accepted as a basis for talks, but which Ukraine did not. And then nuclear weapons were brought into the whole mix when Britain agreed to hand over some, uh, you know, uh, de, uh, de uh, decommissioned, uh, degraded uh, fissile material uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and Russia said it was going to station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Uh, you know, are we approaching the edge, do you think, Stephen, with your experience of Russia, China, and of course, uh, uh, the UK? Well, yes, we're we're certainly approaching the edge when you put nuclear weapons right on the uh, the uh, edge of let me say the border between the European uh, Union and uh, the uh, Russian state. So certainly that's uh, that's a big step forward. Uh, the decommission, the degraded uh, uranium uh, was an excuse by Putin, and I. Uh, think that that's a, that's a definite concern as far as the uh russia china uh relationship um supposedly china is not supplying weapons i don't i don't uh, think that uh it's going to be easy for china to continue that stance private companies private chinese companies may in fact be supplying that because china cannot afford to have russia lose in this case when it's been portrayed as very pro uh 
Russia. But uh, the Chinese peace plan, too, that's 12 point, as I've, I've looked at the 12 points, it's it's not really a plan. It's, it's just a, a statement that almost like the UN would put out, stop the Cold War, provide humanitarian relief and so forth down the line, open the grain area. Any government could have put out that same same plan. So uh, the China, China's role is is still, I think, yet to be defined. I think that China is careful about that, uh, although clearly it has a pro uh, Russia tilt, if for no other reason than it's concerned about the United States, and so it doesn't want the United States to succeed. And I think also the the other issue that behind the scenes going on is is the international financial system. Uh, China and Russia would like to see. Uh, it, the financial system move away from the dollar, which is uh, uh, a linchpin to American strength globally. So uh, if, they could, if that could happen, that more countries would use the yuan uh, as the primary currency, then there's going to be a shift in the world order. So I think that's in play behind the scenes and not very far behind the scenes as well. Now, Stephen, uh, you, you're very familiar also with the trade relations between all these countries. And one would naturally have expected with all the rounds of sanctions and, uh, um, you know, war in, uh, in the, uh, virtually the center of Europe, that trade would have gone down. Uh, but it comes as a surprise to some that, as a matter of fact, in some instances, trade is increasing, even, I even in between. Uh, 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 some of the countries that are supposed to be under sanctions and some of those that are, are, are sanctioning them. And uh, in that regard, people point to third parties. I ask you about this because you're quite uh, knowledgeable and you know a lot about the trade uh, uh, relations between these countries. Was it naive to expect that trade would halt or significantly drop simply because there was a conflict uh, uh, you know, at the time? Well, I, I think we should have expected, uh, and I think some people did expect, uh, an increase of trade, particularly between China and, and uh, Russia. They both need each other in many ways. R Russia has a lot of significant resources, including timber, certainly energy, all that is needed for a growing uh, Chinese economy or energy in the case of maintaining the Chinese economy. So, uh, and Russia needs needs the, sort of the, the money from uh China to to keep the war going, so it it uh, is it shouldn't be a surprise to see trade actually increase in that in that area. Um, as far as globally, China certainly has not stepped back from its role in trade in, in globally, and I think that uh, again I I'm not a defender of China, but I think that every country has the right to to work on its own trade relationships. So it it shouldn't be surprising. And sa sanctions have have an effect, but they they are not the the answer to all things. And I think that uh, sanctions sometimes have a have a counter effect uh, from their their intentions. So uh, I, I think that again that trade is going to continue very actively between Russia and China, and of course then those who are engaged uh, with, with that uh, politically are going to uh, increase that as well. China's role in the Middle East, uh, particularly in uh, brokering the Saudi and Iran uh, peace agreement, certainly is going to uh, increase trade relationships there as well. So uh, it's it's a long, long process. and, and uh, I, I think that sanctions will have a limited effect, but they will have some effect. I, I can't let you go, Stephen, without asking you about the conflict itself, because that uh, ultimately is the reason why all of this has assumed new importance. Uh, and the way it is going, uh, and from where you're able to look at it, uh, giving your bird's eye view, uh, is there anything that has happened uh, or that needs to happen uh, for there to be a move from this grinding attrition uh, of deaths and uh, new deaths and new attacks and counterattacks, uh, sometimes in Russia itself uh, at this point, uh, and America spending billions. We have seen this before, and I was reading an article over the weekend where, you know, there was some kind of tally about how much America has been spending in some of these conflicts, mm -hmm. uh, more than a trillion dollars in Iraq, uh, depending on who you ask. Uh, in Afghanistan, something similar, 
uh, or slightly less. And then already in Ukraine, within the last one year, the estimates vary, but you could be talking of as much as 40 to $50 billion already uh, um, that has gone both in terms of aid and uh, weaponry uh, uh, to Ukraine uh, from the United States. So I ask, you know, at what point do you think uh, people are going to go wary of this and they're going to force the parties to a table? Well, I, I think people are wary already, but whether they can force uh, anything to the table yet, I'm not sure. I, I am one that thinks that by the fall, there is going to be some some movement uh, at, at the table. There almost has to be. Your, your figures that you cite, I think, are accurate, and if anything, they're conservative in terms of uh, the, the spending, particularly from the United States, but also uh, it, there's going to be enormous, and already is enormous, spending from, from Russia, from Europe, and so forth. So how long you can continue that, I don't know. I think that the uh, it is your your um, verb of grinding uh, is correct. I think it's also very draining on, on everyone, and I think there's got to be some resolution. But right now, it's a stalemate. One of the concerns that I have is, is the role of the Wagner Group. Uh, it is a private army, in essence, and it, it, uh, I think it's very fair to compare it to uh, what uh, the Germans had in World War before World War II and World War II in terms of the Nazi Party. The uh, Nazis were, in, in essence, uh, Hitler's private. The SS, I should say, the SS were Hitler's private army, and it's a brutal, brutal group of the dregs of society. And it seems that, and and it was a horrible group. And I think the Wagner Group is, is something is parallel to that. So I think their inclusion, particularly in uh, Bakhmut, uh, is is important to note. Uh, and it's also important to note that they're they are in a sense proxy for some of the Russian army, which is putting pressure on 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 Putin. So so uh, it's going to be an, an interesting time. I think that uh, there really needs to be um, some di more than dialogue. There needs to be some resolution as soon as possible. Uh, when that's going to come, it's obviously not going to be right away. But I think over the next few months, uh, we'll, we'll know uh, the trends of the war right now. Right now, you're right. I think it's pretty much a stalemate. Indeed. Uh, President Cohen and Woods International, uh, Stephen Hayes, as always, thank you for your perspective, deep perspective and understanding uh, of uh, the jurisdiction surrounding this conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Always an honor. Thank you. And after the break, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu promises to boost munitions supply to Russian forces fighting in Ukraine. Details in a moment. Please stay up with us. Welcome back. Finland's main conservative party has claimed victory in a tightly fought parliamentary election. With all of the votes counted, the center-right National Coalition Party came out on top with 20.8%. They were followed by the right-wing populist party, the Finns, with 20.1%, while Prime Minister Sanna Marin's Social Democrats garnered 19.9%. With the top three parties each getting around 20% of the vote, no party is in a position to form a government alone. Over 2,400 candidates from 22 parties are vying for the 200 seats in the Nordic countries' parliament. Meanwhile, Montenegro's former economy minister, Yakov Milatovic, declared a victory in a presidential election runoff over long-standing incumbent Milo Djukanovic, ending more than three decades of his rule of the small Balkan Republic. The 37-year-old Western-educated Vesti Milatovic, the deputy head of the Europe Now movement, campaigned on pledges to cut graft, improve living standards and bolster ties with the European Union and fellow former Yugoslav Republic, Serbia. In the capital, Podgorica, some of his jubilant supporters drove through the city centre honking their car horns, while others set up fireworks or fired guns into the air. Mr. Milatovic won 60.1% to Mr. Jadanovic's 39.9%. The Podgorica-based Centre for Monitoring and Research Bolster said on the basis of results tabulated from a statistical sample of votes cast. 
Three British men have been uh, detained by the Taliban in Afghanistan. That's according to the non-profit Presidium and Network. The UK non-profit, which provides support to communities in crisis, tweeted that it had been working with the families of two of the detained men in support of finding a resolution and release for the detainees. According to the statement, the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office is working to contact the detained British nationals and also support their families. Scott Richards, co-founder of the Presidium Network, claims the detention of the three men is ultimately the extension of a misunderstanding. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu has promised to boost munition supplies to Russian forces in Ukraine during a visit to the headquarters of Moscow's troops fighting in the country. In video published by the Defense Ministry, General Shogu has shown presided over a meeting with senior military officers, including General Valery Gerasimov, Russia's most senior soldier. General Shogu has in recent months come under criticism from hardline advocates of Russia's campaign in Ukraine, including Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner Mercenary Group, who have accused him of failing to supply sufficient munitions to troops on the front line. Dear colleagues, the issue of supplying troops with lethal weapons is currently under constant control by the government and by the Ministry of Defense. The volume of supplies of the most needed ammunition has been determined. Necessary measures are being taken to increase them. This week, I checked the fulfillment of the state's defense order by the defense industry for the production of ammunition. Due to the expansion of production capacities and the increase in labor productivity, the production to support the troops has increased manifold. It includes both conventional and high-precision weapons. National Security Risk Strategy and former British police officer Vince Iacuelo joins us virtually now from Enuguagidi in Anambra State to speak more on uh, some of these issues. Good morning to you. Uh, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's look at the issue of uh, uh, nuclear weapons, shall we, Mr. Yekwelu? Um Many people seem to be quite uh, dismissive about nuclear weapons uh, because they say that, you know, everybody knows that if you use nuclear weapons, then everybody, you know, suffers as a result. Uh, but it only takes a mistake for one to go off, doesn't it? And then secondly, is not all nuclear weapons that are exactly like the ones dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We are told that there are now smaller nuclear weapons called tactical nuclear weapons, and those can be deployed on a smaller scale. And that is what Russia is talking about putting in Belarus. So are we being naive to assume uh, that nuclear weapons are off the table anytime we have this kind of discussions? I can assure you, I can assure you, uh, at least in the nearest future, the deployment of nuclear weapons is off the table in the nearest future. At least I can assure you that in the summer period, uh, we are about to get things involved in the, in the summer in, in Europe and in America. I can assure you, at least at this stage in the three summer period, the, the deployment of nuclear weapons is off the table. However, in war, everything is fair. Every uh, party has to defend their, uh, their power to show that they have what it takes. Don't forget, Russians actually understand the Americans. It's been dictated the Russians and the Americans have been having this kind of uh, uh, front-to-back uh, uh, challenges in the past. So Russians understand the Americans very well. The Americans understand the Russians very well. So what has changed in this period is nuclear powers like China, are now on the table supporting Russians. Nuclear powers like India are also on the table supporting the Russians. So it's actually a different ball game now. And I believe the presence of the Chinese and the Indians would not allow the Russians to deploy, to deploy nuclear weapons just like that. Obviously, it, it's not a mistake to deploy nuclear weapons. It's a tactical deployment. The, the president has to get involved. The parliament has to get involved. So it's not what you can deploy by mistake. And you're, you're right to say it's more tactical. You can deploy smaller 
nuclear warfare that doesn't need to affect all the whole global region across where it was deployed. So it's become more more intelligent. It's become more smarter. But the, the bottom line is the world needs to look at how to start to de-escalate the situation. It's not easy for anybody in, in back north. It's not easy for anybody in Ukraine. It's not even easy for people in Russia because in the past 48 hours, there was a bomb blast in a, ca in a cafe in, in, Kre in Kremlin, in Russia. And somebody died. People died. Lives were lost. There are injuries. The same thing in Ukraine. The world has to start to de-escalate this situation because Russia has a right to mount nuclear warheads in, in Belarus. If they have a right, just like America has a right to deploy nuclear warheads in, 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 in Finland or in Sweden. So you cannot decide and dictate what the world should be. We have to use with, with nuclear deployment with wisdom. And do not forget, for this month, Russia is in charge of the UN Security Council. And obviously, it's, it's a big propaganda for the Russians because the UN has shown people like the International Olympic Committee, FIFA, and all the sporting organizations that actually stop Russians from participating in global sports. UN has shown that even though Russia has issues with Ukraine and the USA, you cannot deny them of their legitimate right in world affairs. Thank you. The other thing, of course, is that, uh, and I, I want to hear leverage uh, on your uh, your your experience uh, in uh, Britain uh, as uh, uh, as an officer and someone who understands some of the security measures. Uh, quite a number of things, uh, you know, have come out of the push or the decision by Britain to hand over degraded uh, uh, uranium uh, uh, to Ukraine uh, to build uh, body armor uh, to use uh, on their battle tanks and all of that. And Russia, in some ways, is justifying what it is doing on the basis of the fact that, well, that is also going on. Uh, and that why is what they're doing a different from that? Is it, is, it, is it a fair comparison? It, it is fair in war because Britain, obviously, are uh, in support of Ukraine. And you don't have to blame Britain for supporting Ukraine. They have every legal right to support whom they wish to support. And for them to give them degraded um, nuclear armament is actually tactical because such weapons are not just for deployment of attacking people. It can also be used as a defensive mechanism to protect certain um, armor tanks also. So it has the uh, uh, deployment capacity to defend and to also attack. So obviously, I support the government of uh, with Shunak in their, in their choice to, to support uh, Ukraine. And Russia has to also find their own ways to make themselves uh, bigger than the world because uh, it's a war and all is fair in war. And, and Britain has not broken any international codes by what they are doing with Ukrainians. I think they have that right to do that, just like Russians have the right to also arm the Belarus government to support them with nuclear uh, defensive mechanisms. So I think it's fair. However, on the other side, we have to also understand the impact of this war in Europe. Europeans are suffering more from this war, more than the Americans are suffering, because the war is going on in Europe. Russia is a European country. Ukraine is also an European country. And European nations are suffering more. Most of the refugees that are leaving Ukraine are getting involved in Poland, in Sweden, in Finland, in Britain. Europe are, so, are suffering more. And in the next couple of weeks, the summer is going to be upon Europeans. And the price of, key, of, of, of air conditioning for you to be able to walk through the summer region, uh, season in the offices, in all those kind of uh, industries, or, or on the rail, on the rail transport system, uh, the different kinds of offices that you, you, you operate in Europe, it's going to be very tough for people to walk through the summer season without having proper air conditioning because of the high cost of power, energy, because of the Ukraine-Russian war. So Europeans need to step down and try to de-escalate this war because Americans are not suffering as much as Europeans are suffering about this war. That's a very that's a uh, that's a very profound point that uh, you make there. Uh, let me thank you, National Security Risk Strategist, former British Police Officer Vincent Yekwelu, as always. Uh, thank you for your warm uh, perspective, the unique perspective, I should say, uh, on the program as always. And still to come, eleven-year-old boy suffering autism finds remedy from. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back. Saudi Arabia and other OPEC plus oil producers have announced voluntary cuts to their production, with Riyadh saying it would cut output by 500,000 barrels per day from May until the end of 2023. Similarly, Russia's deputy prime minister says Moscow will extend a voluntary cut of 500,000 barrels a day until the end of 2023. The United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Iraq, Oman and Algeria also said they would voluntarily cut output over the same time period. The Saudi Energy Ministry said in a statement that the kingdom's voluntary cut was a precautionary measure aimed at supporting the stability of the oil market. Let's talk now to Ini John Amekwa of our business desk. Ini, good, good morning, morning and a happy Monday, happy first Monday. Monday of the month of April. April yeah. And as a result of that story I just read, oil prices naturally yes, have gone up. Yes, surge about 8%. We've seen oil, we haven't seen oil, you know, hit $80 for some time now, but we've seen Brent hit about $84. That's for Nigeria. That's because that's our own product. Why WTI is just about $80. $80. And, but the other side of it is the risk of inflation again. Uh, if these major oil producers say they're going to extend this to the end of the year, uh, and then we have oil prices ranging at this. And also, remember we have that issue with, between Iraq and Turkey. Yeah. Uh, the Kurdistan, and then we've had that is cutting about 400,000 uh, barrels a day from oil production. So we don't know where oil price is going to go to, especially if China's demand continues to go up and they continue to recover. So that means that um, the hope of inflation tapering may just be going backwards at this time and you know with inflation increasing uh, interest rates hike which is the natural uh, uh, re response from of central course. bank we've of seen course. how that has done to the financial sector the banks and then the threat of recession actually comes back again. The threat of energy prices also comes back again. And, uh, and uh, it doesn't paint a good picture for the world at the end of the day. Even though for a country like Nigeria, oil producers and Angola and all those major guys, they may be making more revenue. But when you look at the bigger picture, it doesn't look so good. Well, it does look as if, I mean, everybody's uh, taking care of themselves, so, so to speak. <laughs> and the rest of the world can discuss what to do. What to do uh, when, with the consequences. When, when it comes to that. <laughs> but that, that, there's also a dollar dominant side yes. to this issue. Yes. It, it's not just about cuts. Yes, it's not just about cuts because OPEC Plus is meeting today. And we've been talking about this issue of de-dollarizing de the global economy. Right. Guess what? I have, I have some dates here. On the 28th of March, Brazil and China, two members in increasing in BRICS, right. they announced an agreement to conduct all future trade transactions using their own currencies. currencies. Mm. So dollar is out of that. On the 8th of March also, you have Indian customers that paid most of their Russian oil uh, trade yeah. In non we discussed that here. Exactly. Our viewers will remember that. Exactly. On the 29th of March, Saudi Arabia announced that it has agreed to become a dialogue partner uh, in Shanghai Corporation. Uh, and this is like BRICS. Right. You know, fighting against the West. Because they were first observers, now they're actually wanting to join. And guess what? Saudi Arabia and some other majors, because OPEC Plus is meeting today, one of the uh, stories or one of the, sto uh, one of the uh, uh, topics on the agenda is going away from the dollar, paying for oil prices in the non-dollar currency. So if they go through with that today, that's, I mean, that's... That would be another milestone. Exactly. On the 28th of March, French oil giant Total uh, announced that it had completed its first purchase of liquefied natural gas from Chinese oil using the one. Hmm. So these are major... You're talking about it's oil not, and it's, gas. Not, it's not going to arrive suddenly. It's going to arrive... Slowly. Slowly. But we haven't heard from the United States because I'm sure they're not sleeping. The, they do and not that want they know to be... all this. They know all yeah, this. Of course, obviously. Perhaps they're strategizing. Let's see what they have. Let's see how successful that will go. And then we will now bring our, our, our counter, counter strategy. Speaking <laughs> about the U.S., it's considering a draft law related to the Black Sea. What's that about? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, mean I guess that, I think that's the first normal question because the U.S. does not have its territory close to the Black Sea. 
uh, the two uh, major, the two countries, the EU countries, Bulgaria and Romania, are the ones, the EU. The other ones are Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, you know, and, and all of that. So what's U.S. business with the Black Sea? Well, good, guess what? Good question, which I expect <laughs> to find some kind of answer from you. For. Obviously. So uh, U.S. said that they're going to have an interagency strategy for increasing United States military aid and coordination with NATO and the EU and uh, it's going to be a 100 it's going to be adopted 180 so they are not claiming that they have uh, territory, territory in the Black Sea, area, but right. they have friends, NATO, EU, you know, of course we talked about the two EU countries that are there. So they are saying they want to increase their military aid in the Black Sea. But I don't know what Russia would do about this because Russia has <laughs> it a major territory. I, I actually thought you, you were going to get to that and then tell us what Russia was going no, to do. No, but you know the way these things work. We just talked about how they're trying to de-dollarize de -dollarize the indeed. economy and we have not heard what U.S. is planning yet. So in this case, it's Russia. It's the U.S. that is proposing. We have not heard what Russia is doing. Yes, they are just waiting. Let's, let's see what they want to do. You say you want to increase your military aid. Then I'll tell you this is my territory. And, and then... we already have military assets. So that's another exactly. potential flashpoint. Honestly, honestly. And now, but talking about Russia, in Russia itself, funds for individuals on deposits for a period of one year, mm -hmm decreased yeah someone will say this is not surprising it's not surprising i guess because uh with all of the uncertainty even though we'll see president putin say that oh the sanctions are not really well we're doing well the ruble is looking okay even though on friday the ruble drops i mean dropped to i think 11 month low that yes. was just on friday right. you know so even though the, the russia will say this and that the Russians or residents in Russia are not so certain anymore. So they've seen the deposit of uh, their money in banks because they don't know what's going to happen. Remember at one time, especially when the war just started, right. uh, they were told to convert Indeed. foreign yes. currency into rubles. Into rubles. So a lot of people do not know which way it's going to take next. So, I mean, it's better let's just hold our money. <laughs> our yes, money. ourselves. Exactly. And, and this is happening at the same time that the digital ruble yeah. You remember we discussed the yes. digital ruble. It yeah. was supposed to start on Saturday, the 1st of April, but now it's been postponed indefinitely. And, this and maybe that followed what happened that you were talking about on Friday. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this is after the banks have put in place the technicalities and all of that. So they've obviously spent a lot of money Indeed. and up Preparing their game for this. For this. And the, the, the constraint here is coming from the government. It's the final legislating authority or, or stamp that is needed for this to go into action that has stalled this. And nobody knows the mind of the president. So How, how, how are our markets? reacting first of all maybe i should I'll start by asking how did our own market do with all this uncertainty well our markets at first were happy because the markets recovered from the you know svb issue uh because we did see some the people were still asking me over the weekend those that uh, are able to communicate mm. with me about what's our business how did svb get no, to well, us and I, had, I had to re-explain <laughs> so again that's part of the reason why i'm the asking the world is markets. a global village the world is a global village you don't know where for instance the issue of dollar if dollar drops if the value drops it affects our course, debt it affects our borrowing it affects our assets it affects our reserves so it's it's one village i mean ghana is having issue with its uh, debt program and there's the fear of it spinning over to, Ni to Nigeria, even though the ZBN is assuring us one way to say, okay, that nothing is going to spill over. But, you know, it's, a, it's one global village. So um, if it happens in the United States, it happened in Switzerland. That's These right. are countries that are supposed to have strong financial foundation. Then what stops it from spilling over? How do you know if your bank did not invest? Indeed. Because that's what happened in SVB. The investors there. Yeah, it's not like the money got missing or no. was stolen. Exactly. Because of interest rate, people thought, I mean, the bonds are not growing. Let me just take my money before the value goes down. Indeed. How are you sure the MD of your bank did not invest in SVB? That's right. <laughs> because it will affect the assets of your bank Absolutely. and eventually affect your money because you used your money. Money to <laughs> clear, 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 clear indeed. Clear indeed. Indeed, of course, uh, uh, some of these questions will also come to you mm -hmm. uh, in the course of the day uh, on Business Morning and Business Incorporated. But for now, thanks. Thank you for having me.
Finally on the program, drawing has become a remedy for an 11-year-old boy suffering from autism in Zaporizhia, bringing him much-needed comfort and encouragement despite the lingering conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Although Maxim Brovchenko is living with autism, a developmental disorder of the nervous system, he is passionate about learning about the world and about creating. He started drawing three years ago as lockdowns uh, to prevent the COVID-19 from spreading made him bored uh, and uh, feeling tedious. While uh, Brovchenko expresses his sorrow through paintings, the cats at his home bring him some comfort, though. The 11-year-old dreams of being a universe researcher and finding the ninth planet. Thanks for being with us. That's our program this Monday morning. It's been a pleasure bringing it to you. My name is Ladi Akari Duluali. Do have a pleasant day and week ahead. Good morning. Yeah,